What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. But it's not the Dr. Vibe show. We're continuing the journey in 2020 of the men and masculinity conversations called Eminem Explores. And if you've been keeping up to date, or if you haven't, I'm going to bring you up to date. We are very blessed and highly favored to have uh, two outstanding male leaders, male thought leaders, male thought leaders. That's what I'm going to call that. Yeah, male thought leader is going to be joining us twice a month throughout 2020. One is MJ Durkin, who will be on later on this week uh, on Thursday evening. But we first have Robert Leung, a, a gentleman that I've got to know very better and has also leveled me up <laughs> in many conversations online and offline. Robert, how are you? I'm great tonight, Dr. Vibe. And thank you back at you, by the way, in terms of being uplifted by another person. You have done so for me. I, I receive that. I absolutely receive that. Happy 2020 to you, Thank by you. the way. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you, we're going to get sick of each other because we're going to be doing this at least 12 times. <laughs> year. I so, look forward to that. I do, too. I look forward to to learning, growing, and sharing. Me, too. That's, That's why I'm it. here. That's it. So. For those who don't know about Robert's background, look at previous conversations because it's all there. We're going to get right into it because we don't want to waste any time because uh, time never lost a fight. Remember that. <laughs> time well, never lost well a said. Fight. Well said. Absolutely. Tonight, the, the first of our series of 2020 conversations, the title of our conversation is What Are Men Facing in the Next Decade? And What Could a Man Accomplish in the Next Decade? And the first time I shared this with Robert, I think I caught him off guard. He said, <laughs> what? Like a decade? What? Yeah. <laughs> and, and Robert, and he was laughing as he is now. He's going, Dr. Vibe's gone crazy again. <laughs> Bringing up another crazy conversation topic. But as we converse more and more offline, we thought that this would be a very meaningful conversation for men. Indeed. Because um, we're starting another decade. Right, and, we are, and, uh, and it's it's uh, it's going to bring its challenges. But uh, a, one of the books I read says, "Where there's no vision, the people perish." That's a great saying. I think that's probably true. I think what doesn't so, kill us makes us stronger is another another way of putting that. Exactly. So we thought it'd be a good idea to have this conversation for men who have a vision and men who don't have a vision. So Robert. When I shared this topic with you, tell the people your first reaction, and then why do you feel it's a good conversation topic 27 days into a new decade? Well, at first, I when, when, you, when you presented it, I, I was a little bit overwhelmed with looking at a decade um, and a decade ahead in terms of you know what, what the future would uh, hold for us. And um, I didn't quite know how to get my head wrapped around that. And... Um, but once I started doing a little bit of research and getting getting a framework to, to, to try to have this conversation, I found there was a, a lot of material to work with, certainly uh, certainly in looking at, you know, not just what we're going to accomplish, but, you know, what we're facing. Uh, it, was, it was part of what I took a look at first, because um, we are facing a lot of challenges. And I you know, I, I don't think they're going to change uh, dramatically, except to get more um, intense within the next decade. Um, so, once I got a grip on that, got my teeth into it, I was feeling a little better. Yeah. So you mentioned some of the challenges that men are facing at the beginning of this decade, and you said you've done some research. What did your research bring to fruition about some of the challenges that men are facing at the beginning of this decade? Well, there were, were a, a, a plethora, if you will, of things uh, that they're facing. And, and one of the things I looked at was, uh, it's something that everybody's facing, but the unique way that men face these particular issues. And, and one of them was uh, uh, scarcity of resources in the world and how that would affect the economy. Um, uh, things like falling housing prices, which are happening right as we speak, uh, the fluctuations in oil prices, I just read an interesting fact. The student debt crisis is $1.5 trillion. Oh, no. 
and the things like the rise of artificial intelligence and how that would fa uh, affect automation and jobs. Something like the loss, the predicted loss of 40 million jobs in the United States over the next the next five years, five to 10 years. So, you know, all of those speak to, certainly speak to women as well, but, um, you know, men still as, as breadwinners and as they see that as a critical part of their persona, um, it's gonna affect them. Um, there are also things like, um, I began to look, and this is something we've discussed before, but the unrealistic and stereotypical portrayals of men in the media and in our culture and how that puts, continues, to, and that's been around for a while. That's an, an ongoing an ongoing issue. But I think it's only gotten stronger with the advent of additional um, means of communication and, and media. Um, so they're feeling, continuing to feel the same pressure to maintain those images at the same time that those a lot of the, a lot of those images are being assaulted, um, the stereotypical images of men are being assaulted. So on the one side they're being told you, this is the way you have to be, and on the other side they're being told don't be that way. So that that conflict has become stronger over the last uh, decade, and it's certainly going to become stronger in the future as women become more and more powerful and more influential in our culture. Um, I, I, sorry. I want but I want to go back to the scarcity of resources. I think that was a very interesting area to start off with. And the, when you mentioned the scarcity of resources and uh, the commentary you had on top of that, it seemed to be mostly economic. And I want to also take a look, what are the scarcity of resources to help men be men? <laughs> well, that, you know, that's a whole other uh, discussion in and of itself, but that's, that's a great tie into that, that, sense of resources because there just aren't a lot of resources for men to um to adjust and to change and to support that change and i think that's that's a great great question um i actually had done some research around that but i i sort of put that aside but yeah you're right there aren't that there aren't as many support networks for men to uh, adapt to um the changes in our culture and our society and that's a critical that's a critical part of um, the problem for them as well. I I'm gonna parking lot that for a future conversation, but yeah. I I want to delve a little bit more into that, and I won't go full blown into it. But you have had the opportunity of blessing to coach and help men for many years. Yes. How does it make you feel? when you still feel there's a scarcity of resources in 2020, because I know when you first started coaching men, there was a scarcity of resources. So yes, that's, that's true. true. Like, why not more resources? And we've had offline conversations where you've talked about some current concerns about the, uh, the state of men's groups. Right. Right. I, I, you know, I think the, the biggest issue and the biggest reason that there are not as many resources is because men are not demanding resources. They're still somewhat caught in the man box, if you will, of we've got to just tough it out. You know, we don't we don't complain about these things. We don't cry about them. We don't whine about them. We're men. This is how we deal with things. And so we're not out there in, a, in as powerful a way and as an organized a way as as women are in demanding what we need. And in some ways, we don't want to acknowledge our own weaknesses. So we're, we're in some ways captive of our own, you know, sense of masculinity and what it is. So asking for help is a sign of weakness. And I think that's the biggest issue, frankly. I think if we were organized and as organized and as committed to doing that as, as women, I think we'd have everything we need. I, I'm going to behave myself because I so much want to go down that path. Tonight. That's a great one too. I have to say, that's a great I, topic. I'm going to, I'm going to restrict myself, but that one's going to be an up and comer. Uh, yeah. You also mentioned about portrayal in the media. Were there any other areas where you felt, uh, cause you said there was a myriad. What were some of the, yeah, the disposability of men was another one. Um, the fact that we take on a large, a lot of jobs that are potentially fatal, you know, a shorter lifespan, 
we go to war when there is war to be gotten to. Um, there's that that we're considered in a sense disposable in a way that um, I think women are not. We don't just send them into these. They're not, you know, they don't take on those kind of jobs. It's traditionally those have been the occupations of men. Um, there's a, you know, and this, I, I think the perception is re reinforced in, in every aspect of our society. Um, you know, sports sets us up as this masculine identity of, of taking risk, putting yourself in danger is a part of being a man. Um, so that uh, affects us, uh, certainly affects our lifespan. And when, and the opposite of that is when we're not no longer able to, um, perform physically in a lot of senses, take on those risks, do those things, whether they're in dangerous jobs in as a career, or for example, in sports, um, when you're no longer the sports hero, you're put out to pasture, you're just, you're, you're no longer acknowledged, you're old and feeble. And, and because of that, you've lost whatever cachet, whatever identity that you've had before and whatever, um, whatever validity in our society you've lost in a lot of ways. So there's that. Um, um, even, and even on the other end of the scale from being old and feeble is how we raise young boys and, and um, the conflict in raising them now. And in some ways, I think trying to raise the masculinity out of them um, in, as a means of making them more well adjusted in society. And, and I think that that's a dangerous route to go down to where they shouldn't be as quote unquote aggressive. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that's, that, I think that's a part of their biological nature, their, their gene structure to, to be more aggressive, but in a, in a responsible, it can be in a responsible way. So I think those are some of the other challenges that, among others that, that, that men are facing. And, and I, they're likely to be with us, not just for the next decade, but perhaps the next century. Well, I'm, I'm going to drop um, a story here that happened to me today. And I'm going to, I told Robert, I drop it in during our conversation, because I think it, it, it's a perfect example of some of the subjects that he highlighted on. For those who don't know, um, my full-time gig is helping fathers especially but i help men in general and i had an appointment today with a young man who's in his early to mid 30s and i had him come in to our center and i said sit down tell me your story and this story was incredible because and i'll just give certain highlights he's never had a good relationship with his mother or his father mm. And wow. one of the things, um, to the point, well, when he was being raised, the father wasn't in the picture at all. But here's the thing. His mother lives lived in Toronto. His grandparents lived in New York. And he couldn't get along with his mother. So he has spent time in his life going back and forth living in Toronto and New York. Oh, wow. And, his, and he basically said, my grandparents raised me in New York. I was right. born and they raised me. And he said that every time he'd go back and live with his mother, his mother for some reason had to move. And he told me that he's in his mid thirties. He has moved over 20 times in his life. Oh my God. Wow. How does that affect you, man? Yeah. Just, just it's, phenomenal. It's a bit mind boggling. Yeah. And, um, he's, he has children. He has two with one partner, first partner. He's with another lady now, has another set of kids. He has another child. So he has three children in total. And the story was just fascinating. And, and uh, basically, his mother is just, it's not going to work probably for a while. With his father, um, again, he didn't see his father a lot. I said, well, when's the last time you reached out to your father? He said, two Christmases ago. Wow. That's the last time he tried to reach out to his father. And when he did, his father wasn't really receptive. So he just given up on his father. Yeah. And I said, and I suggested to him, you know what? Reach out to him again and just ask him a few things, asking, you know, how important is their relationship? And if it is to see if a meeting can get arranged. 
Right. But this, you know, and it, I saw a perfect example of what some many men are needing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what they're facing. Because he had he had no resources. He basically said, yeah. um, he all he said is, I need to be a better man. Um, and I said, I can work with that. Yeah. Well, good for you. I'm glad it's good that he had an opportunity to talk to you and you could point him in the right direction. Well, but we're I, not a one, we're not a one and done. I, I gave him some goals and then I said to him, he said, I said, well, what do you want to do? He said this, 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 and this. I said, well, let me give you a little difference. Then I suggested to him, why don't you choose one word for your year? Instead of the New Year's resolutions, <laughs> make one word. And I said to him, Hearing some of your story, one of the words that sticks out with me is stability. Right. And he said, you know what? You are so right. That's so great. I, I gave him the challenge the next time he sees me that I asked him for a list of every area in his life that he wants stability in. That's a great start. And then we're going to, we're going to work with that. And I think that, as Robert has said, the lack of resources... I think one of the th one of the things I see many men lacking is a lack of human male or man resources. Right. Yeah, that's not that's not easy to find, and finding men leaders or leadership in leadership positions that are willing to take the time and have the ability to reach out to young men and you know reach them in a way that's meaningful is is not easy to find. Robert, would you add on to that, not just young men, but men in general? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, men still have a difficulty connecting with each other outside of the, you know, traditional ways of connecting, watching sports together or playing sports together or, you know, uh, going out and having a drink or whatever. They're, you know, typically they're, they're ways of connecting that are not really personal and not really emotional. So they don't go to a deeper level. Um, and since sharing your weaknesses is considered a weakness among men, it's really hard for men to have those conversations to develop relationships with uh, with other men um, that become uh, more mature in a lot of ways, and more supportive, and more real. You know, I think that's that's you know we part of our own dynamic, cultural dynamic keeps us separated from each other as a demonstration that we're independent, we can take care of ourselves, we don't need anybody else. That whole ethos, which is which is good in a way, but taken to an extreme, it separates us, isolates us, and has us, you know, um, afraid or embarrassed to ask for help or support. So. I, I, and I wanna go back again to the scarcity of resources and an issue when you mentioned that you were talking about economic stuff, how again with your journey in helping men is the economic force as strong today and going into a new decade compared to when you started helping men be better when you say the economic force what do you mean how how, how important how much importance men put on money ah, i think after your sexual prowess money is probably the most important in fact it's almost part of that prowess you know how how, how much money you have what tech what um what tangible things you have to prove that you're a man your car and your house and your clothes and you know all of those things um, and your job certainly are your position in the world is a part of your masculinity and i'm not saying that's not important on some level but those things are all outside of you you know, in the end, it's what's inside of you that really matters. But those trappings of success and power, um, you know, are, are part of how we see ourselves. So it's it's difficult to divorce yourself from that. And that's also reinforced in our culture and in the movies and in every, in every way possible. So it's inevitable that we would have a strong desire to, to see ourselves that way. So, yeah, I don't think you can separate that. Another thing that you had mentioned, and I don't think we've talked a lot about it, you and I live, but the whole aspect of disposability of men. Mm. It, it, yeah. it's, and it seems that it's not stopping. I, I know I've been involved in conversations with them and say, I don't need no man. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's become a big topic of conversation. Um, it It's funny because that idea of be, men being disposable, it reminds me of a show that used to be on. I can't remember the name of it, but it was, I think it was called Dirty Jobs, actually. Okay. And it, it was um, on one of the cable channels. But um, the guy who did it was really funny, a really interesting guy. And he would just go out and find the dirtiest jobs and sometimes the most dangerous jobs to do. And the whole show was about men doing dirty, dangerous jobs that nobody else wanted to do. And the, the, they were the jobs that men men took. So I think there's, I, I think there's a, a badge of courage involved in that too. I mean, doing the most dirty, dangerous thing is a man, another way of saying, you know, I'm a man, I'm a true man. You know, I'm willing to do the most dangerous dirty jobs so um yeah it's interesting when you just said that phrase i'm a true man i wonder, right. I, I wonder how many men say that these days and how many men are comfortable saying that these days uh, that's a good that's a good uh question i i think you're right i think it's it's a little more um whispered now than it, it might have been back in the day, or men say it amongst themselves. Um, but you're right, I, I don't think um, those traditional or stereotypical ways that men took pride in portraying themselves are, are as, uh, as valid now or are acknowledged now as they used to be. In some ways that's unfortunate because I think being willing to do the tough thing is, is a really Take the Take the valid. Risk. Yeah, it's really important to be able to do that, to have people who are willing to do that in our society, you know. So, Robert, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to share in regards to when you look at things that you are facing as a man, how do you achieve those things? Because, And you don't have to give anything specific that you're looking to accomplish in the next decade, but... How, what is your process as a male thought leader on how to approach and succeed in those things that you want to accomplish? Because I'm sure men would learn from listening to this live or watching it live or listening or watching on a replay. Well, the first thing I would say is one of the things that I think probably coaches say on teams a lot, but it's the first thing that jumped into my mind is don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. Stop right there. <laughs> so that's a challenge in herself because yeah. men are taught to be warriors right. by themselves. So isn't right. that a contradiction? Well, that's why I mentioned team it was part okay. of one of the places I learned that. I think a lot of men learn that is being on a team because you can't do it all by yourself. That's where you learn it. And that's where you learn it's okay to depend on your teammate do that we don't do that in our personal lives a lot but we'll do it if we play on a team a basketball team or a hockey team or wherever you're playing we'll do it there because that's acceptable and i'm just saying bring that concept into your life don't live your life alone and unsupported by yourself and i've been part of a men's team i've mentioned that over 30 years now and i was never part of a team before that it was i was on sports team Right. But I was never part of a team that probed into my manhood and masculinity in a in a direct way. Indirectly on a team, did you make that shot? Were you willing to try? You know, all of those dynamics. But they weren't internal. They weren't like looking at me and going, say, okay, well, what makes you a man? What What's that about? What does it look like for you? You know, questions I'd never really asked myself. But this other team of men that I've been part of as an adult for the last over 30 years has been all about that. What does it really mean to be a man? What does it mean to have integrity? What does it mean to make a commitment? What does it mean to keep your word? Things that were just sayings to me before that I'd heard on television or my father had mentioned to me, suddenly having, what is it like to live those things? Right. And I think that's a conversation you can't have or shouldn't have by yourself. You want to have it with other men. And men are responsible and, and, dependable and have integrity and learning about integrity. You can, I think that's the place you learn it. You learn it from other men, you learn it by example. So that's, a, it's a 
continuation of fathering. Ah, oh, okay. And that's how I see it too. Now I'm older now, so I'm more in the role of doing some of the, that fathering kind of work, but men can father each other at any age by supporting each other and being willing to listen. Okay. So don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. Anything else? Um, well, in following that out, the, the not doing it alone part is there are plenty of men's organizations to become part of. And so I would, I would make that a part of your, your curriculum for being a man. You know, I wouldn't just, um, you know, call up your friends and go to the movies together. I, you know, indulge in conversations about what's going on for them and what kind of challenges are they facing? Engage men in conversation. So I think that's a, that's a big part of it. In order to understand where you are in the spectrum of men, you've got to know other men and be part of the conversation. And if you, if you don't do that, I think you'll have an ongoing insecurity about yourself that remains unanswered. And, and I think that can be damaging and it certainly puts you at a disadvantage. I, I love that phrase, ongoing insecurity. Mm. Very, yeah. that's a very powerful two words. Yeah, I've lived it and I know what that's like. And uh, I don't, I don't think you know it until you come up against another man who doesn't have that. Mm. That's what happened to me. I met somebody and I thought, wow, that guy is so confident. Where did he, where did he get that from? I want some of that. And that's what changed me. I did this men's weekend as a result of that because this man had been to the weekend and he told me, I went to this weekend and that's where I got it. And I, I was afraid to go, but I said, you know what? I want that confidence. And that was another, you know, challenge. Mm. In, in regards to the, and you bring up this word confidence. Again, look at your journey in helping men. Uh, what would you say is the level of confidence of men on a scale of one to 10 that you have, I guess when you started, what was on the scale of one to 10 and what are they at now in your opinion with the men you've dealt with? Um, well, the men I've dealt with in, on my men's teams and, um, and the men I've dealt with in terms of clients, in terms of coaching clients, you know, I'd like to think that we're all better off having had uh, been in a relationship with each other and delved into these subjects um, in a committed manner and for a, a fair amount of time. Uh, because I think, I think I mentioned fathering before, and I think fathering is an ongoing process. It doesn't stop when you're 18, you know, and, and you can be fathered by many different men in your life. I mean, it's the, the man that you work for and the, you know, um, the people that you meet in the course of your life can offer you counsel and fathering if you're open to it. And I think, so that process, I mean, even at my age now, I mean, I'm 69, um, I'm still being fathered by other men because I can't see everything. And, and you know, we're most short-sighted when it comes to ourselves. So I think that's another reason to, to seek out that kind of fathering and counsel of other men who have other experience in other areas. And that's a, that's a critical part of masculinity. When you have confidence, you can accept counseling and fathering you know, in a different way as an adult, you realize you need that, you know, and you can put your ego aside and have the kind of conversations that are gonna help you master manhood. That's good, that's really good. Then, and it just seems that we have a large group of men that are, I would say taking a walk alone in the desert. I don't know. I don't know if I can put it that way. Right. And I just and the, and I just I'm I'm encountering many men like that. That they're they are all alone. I think, and that's one of the greatest challenges I see to men for this next decade. Can they can they get out of their own way? Yeah, I I think you're right. I, I, and we talked about that at the top of the of the show um, that our biggest challenge is is dealing with our own 
ability to seek help and ask for help. I mean, since, you know, the definition of masculinity is you're independent, you're, you can take care of yourself, you don't need other people. How do you go contrary to that and say, well, I need help and I need support? You know, the very definitions that we've created and then that society and the media and everything perpetuates. I mean, uh, and even women to ex expect you to be independent, self, self-reliant. Um, and then, so how do you go in and say, I don't know how to do this. I'm afraid, you know, um, uh, I want to cry. You know, where do you go with that? You can't even go to other men with that because while they may feel the same way to acknowledge it would be, would break the code, you know? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a trap in itself. That stereotypical way of being is a trap for many men. I think a lot of men are uncomfortable with it. They'd like to change it, but they don't want to lose their, their man card. You know, they're, they don't want to lose their membership to the club. So they're, they're trapped by that, their, that, own, that stereotype. Um, and I, actually, I'm going to bring into the conversation a really great article that Robert shared with me today. And it was written January 17th edition of the, I believe, uh, 2019 of the New York Times. And the article, mm -hmm. the title of the article is The Fight Over Men is Shaping Our Political Future. And it does talk about politics, but we're not going to get into too much of the politics end of from it. But I did want to pull out this paragraph. And uh, the APA, which is, I think, the American Psychological Association. Right, right. They did a survey, a recent survey, and I want everyone to hear this. According to this survey, men commit 90% of the homicides mm -hmm. in the United States. And they represent 77% of homicide victims. Mm -hmm. They are the demographic group most at risk being victimized by violent crime. They are 3.5 times more lucky than women to die by suicide, and their life expectancy is 4.9 years shorter than women's. Boys are far more likely to be diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder than girls, and they face harsh punishments in school, especially boys of color. Yeah. Now, what I just read, that's not great to be looking into a future decade. No, it's not. And it's it's not. I don't think that those statistics have been improving, uh, certainly over the last decade. So you you see there are really tangible challenge of being a man, just being a man, not even doing anything else, you know. So and and again, we're not getting the kind of help or support to address those issues. In fact, we're in many ways, and, and I'm not gonna say that some of the ways aren't justified but we're being assaulted on every level in terms of what being a man is about and and that we're not doing enough to be men um when clearly you know there we have issues around what what is the right and responsible and healthy way for us to be men for ourselves not even for society at large or women or anything else just for us to be human beings in a healthy way so it's a it's great that you brought that statistic up when i read that and i'd read statistics like that before but that was a recent article um, yes and i was i was again and you can't help but be unstunned by that 77 percent of men are victims of of uh, homicide it, it just uh, homicide victims are 70 yeah, percent men i should yeah. put it that way and it just it makes me think that a lot of men have given up Yeah. Yeah, I think they're, well, I don't, I don't think they see an alternative in that. You know, if you've been raised to be um, independent and not complain about things and not talk about your emotions, how do you get help? You can't even ask for help. That's unmasculine. That's not being a man. So it's a, it's a terrible trap. Do we in this upcoming decade do we have to really sit down and i don't know if this is the right phrase tear apart masculinity and put it back together again 
That's a great, that's, that's a great way to put it. I think, I think to some extent we do. I mean, you certainly have to tear apart the, the stereotypes of it. We, we definitely do. We definitely have to give men space to be able to, to express their mind. We have to be humane with men and, and in, and in some sense, give them the room to be human again. Um, I think it does require tearing some things up, no doubt. So Robert, when you say we need men to be human, what does that look like in your mind, in your eyes? Men being human, if, if that, if you could blink your eyes and open your eyes and say men are human, what would that look like? Hmm. Well, we, I think the chief among those things, and this is something that I've talked about with you before too, that we, we have the freedom to express ourselves emotionally without criticism or losing um, the, the sense of our, our masculinity by doing that. And that would require society to support and, and endorse that both culturally and, um, and socially and, and in the media and, and in, the, in all of those ways that reinforce who we are as human beings. I think that sensitivity would be, I think it would be very difficult for society to support us that way, but that's what it would require to give us the room to be able to explore our feelings freely and openly without being criticized and ridiculed, I think. But especially in today's society, say we achieve that, the criticism is still going to come, no matter what. Yeah, I, I think that that's true. Right? But I think if we really want that to happen, we'd have to support men doing that and, and actively support it. And, and because I don't think men, I think I've said this before too, and it sounds ironic in some ways, but I don't think we can help ourselves in this regard. I think so much of our, who we are is caught up in how we are seen. Um, and that this has been culturally reinforced for centuries and since the dawn of man, I would suspect um we were we require help from society in order to change that and if society wants change in men then they need to invest in that too because it it supports society it will make society better and i think so there's a you know there's an opportunity to work together to make things better and i think the same thing is going on for women too I think the difference is women have the freedom, more freedom to ask for help and um, and don't have a problem with, with okay, that. Okay, so Rob, I'm gonna ask you, they have, you said they have more freedom or they are, would you, I'm gonna add this, are they more comfortable to ask for help than men are? Yeah, well that too, I think they're more comfortable because they have the freedom to. Society supports that. They don't say to women, oh, you shouldn't ask for help or you're acting like a, a girl. <laughs> they don't say that. It's perfectly acceptable for women to, and thank God for that. And they're fortunate to have that. We're trapped in our own stereotype. Um, and that's that's a difficult place to be as as, we, as our conversation is, is revealing. We're, we're trapped. Mm. So, that's, that's not a good position for 2020 and beyond saying people are trapped no it's not you know i talk to men all the time and i and i know personally how difficult it's been to get to the place where i could admit and really dig into uh, what i'm feeling and why and and getting past feeling weak and getting past feeling not like a man because i had these feelings i know just tough it out just you know don't talk about that stuff but i think it's it takes a greater strength to dig into those things that we quote unquote call weaknesses and make yourself better if you're if you're really a man then you do the tough work if we do the dirty work the things that nobody wants to do this is that work this is the real stuff the stuff that you don't want to do i say this to men now the stuff that you don't want to do that you're essentially afraid of facing that's the work not avoiding it not ignoring it not playing to the stereotype you know my my resolution was if i'm really a man who's independent and powerful and self-reliant then i get to decide what's right for me 
And that was the beginning of change. But it also helped that I had support, that there were other men to say, you know what? Yeah, you're right. Agreed. And I think that's what men have to stick together and, and really support each other. So how can society help? What are some ways you feel that society can help men move forward in the next decade? What, get, whether it's something tangible, something's intangible, a mix of both, what are some things that you feel that can help make that move forward that we need for many men in the next decade? Well, I think acknowledging that they hear and recognize these, um, these issues for men in their challenges to their masculinity of asking for help. I think opening that conversation and, and I think if there was the same amount of investment in men, men's issues as there is in women's issues, then I think that would, if it got the same amount of attention, I think that would certainly help. Um, recognizing that men have difficulty acknowledging this because of the persona that society has created for them culturally. If we recognize that that's what's part of what's holding them back and finding new ways to have that dialogue, you know, to open that dialogue up, I think it needs, it, it needs more public support and acknowledgement that this is an issue and having people who, you know, having men who, men look up to sports figures and actors and uh, politicians and people who men look up and go, well, all right, he's a man and he's willing to get up there and say that maybe that's set the example, use these people to set the example for men and make them feel like not like they're alone in that issue. we all have this issue. All of us do. We're just human beings um, trying to, you know, make, make things work. So I think having having the kind of campaigns that they've had for on the women's side for women's feminist independence and um, equality um, for men would would be would would help. I think um, social icons would really having them acknowledge the same issues would make it no longer a stigma. Hmm. Stigmas overcoming. Okay. Um, safe. Uh, one of the terms I'm sure you hear, you've probably heard about 2 million times in your journey is safe space. <laughs> right. And I don't know, I'm getting tired of the safe space. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I just want, just get a space and start. <laughs> right. Right. Because, yeah. Safe you know, safe space is being ideal. You may wait forever to get a safe space. Yeah, I, I think that you're right. And I, I, I encourage that too. I mean, don't wait for a safe space. But I think, you know, sometimes I, I think particularly for men, because you don't have as much support example, you know, um, of how to do this. I think uh, it's still kind of, you know, uh, hidden, you know, that these, these events and the opportunity to have that kind of conversation to open up in that way is still going to be triggered by some kind of trauma and some kind of problem, some kind of issue. I think it's still in that state. Um, although there, I think there are more places to have conversation than there were before. There's not as much publicity around that and not as much social acceptability of that. I think that's still a big part of it is like saying, you know, it's okay to do that. It's okay to have these conversations. It's okay to feel that way. The legitimacy has to overcome, remember, you know, literally centuries of saying, you don't talk about that. You don't, you know, how do you, you know, essentially that's the way we've been since the dawn of time, you know, and we're saying, well, just get over it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Easy to say. Yeah. I mean, it's almost the way we are. You know, it's not even like a, it's not even like a thought process anymore. It's just the way we are. We're, we're built that way. So overcoming that's going to require a lot more than just saying, you know, tough it out, dude. You know, I mean, I've done that and I've, you know, I've, I've almost had fist fights with men over that, getting to that place literally has gotten physical on occasion to get them to break down 
enough to feel that way. And that's, that's a tough way to do things. I mean, I've done it a number of times, but it's not easy. It's not a fun thing to do to break somebody down to get to that. I'm not, I'm not saying that's, you know, not an acceptable way to do it, but I'd certainly like to find another, you know, other ways to do that and have conversation about it. But sometimes just to get to that break through that barrier, that's what you have to do. It's a psychological, it's almost like I think a psychological trauma on some way to get there. What do you feel women's role is to help men progress for in the next decade? Because it's been, it, it's been quite a challenging last decade, especially the last three or four years. Right. Um, well, I think, I think acceptance, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing to say, you know what, however you're going to get there, whatever you need to do to get it, I'm behind you. You know, I don't consider just the trappings of masculinity being physical and being dominant and being, you know, stereotypically masculine i don't consider that all that a man is that there's another side to him that is an emotional part of the equation that has feelings that has hurt and pain and sorrow and and sometimes may act in an unstereotypical way um you know we all see those dramatic scenes in movies when a man cries and it's like whoa he cried oh my god that's like you know <laughs> it's a revelation when that happens but if there was the opportunity to support um, that not being such a revelation, <coughs> excuse me, that it was more commonplace for a man to be able to say exactly how he felt and to be emotional. And that wasn't, in some ways, an ultimate demonstration of masculinity to be able to do that, um, to make it more, you know, that, to give that a place to be, that it was okay. I mean, I've, you know, heard stories and I've experienced it myself that, you know, crying in front of a woman, they don't know what to do. And in some ways that turns them off. They don't see that as masculine at all. So I think it would require some understanding and, so, and a lot of support and, and compassion from women, which is a wonderful thing that they bring to relationships and can help men make that transition. So I think that would, you know, and just to be able to be open to that, you know, I think that would help. Mm -hmm. Very, very true. Um, with the with the men's movement for the next decade, what are some words of wisdom, or what are some ways they can help accomplish what they really need to? Would you, any sort of suggestions you have in regards to the men's movement for our, for our twenty twenty decade? Well, I would, I'll say that, you know, in my experience in the men's movement, um, and, and mine started back in the 90s, so it had a, a, a different kind of foundation, and it was a more, you know, in some ways, I think rudimentary in terms of what was legitimate for men in terms of moving forward. And even within the organization that I was involved in, emotional expression was not at the forefront of, of, uh, of their, that movement freeing men to be more emotionally expressive. That was my own take on it. Mm -hmm. So I still think there's a long way to go uh, with that. Um, and so that's, and that would be the thing that I think that I would encourage um, men's groups and organizations to be um, pushing for is to, to have men have the freedom to express themselves emotionally um, without feeling that that took away from their masculinity and i'm not saying that men should just be crying wherever they are but um to recognize that the full range of emotions is acceptable for men to express and that it doesn't take away from who you are as a man in fact i think it it reinforces it and it reinforces your ability more importantly i mean we always think of you know crying as the ultimate you know sort of taboo no-no for men to to do, but being aware and being able to feel your feelings doesn't mean you have to express them either. It just means you have to be conscious of them and not ashamed of them. And I think that's the, the more, most important part of that is not being ashamed of those feelings. I think those are, you know, they're important, powerful, legitimate 
feelings that are critical to you having relationships with other people. And that's why they're so important, not just for you, but in your ability to interact with the people that matter in your life. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, we don't, we want, we don't want men spending time in the cave. No, well, time in the cave is important. Let me, let me say that a certain amount of time in the cave is okay. A certain amount. I uh, agree with that. Yeah. A certain amount, but, but not, but not, not, not exactly. Not, not living there. You know, you got to come out once in a while and check out the sun. So, yeah, but I, I agree with you. Um, let, let, let me ask if some of the things we've discussed over the last little few minutes did come to fruition in a positive way. How would this decade be different than the previous decade? Well, a decade in the scheme of this conversation is a short amount of time, I think. But if some, if there was some change, um, the, the potential, I think, to improve society um, would would gain enormously. Just just the potential, just to see. Oh, look what happened when that they opened up and they opened up and they were able to connect in a different way. Look, look at what happened. And I think then, you know, the just the idea of hope and possibility that that would suggest would open things up in a way that I, I can't even project for our society in terms of community, not just within our culture, but with, for, for the world, the, mm -hmm. what the potential would suggest for the world uh, to be a better place, to be more humane, to understand each other in a different way, to, um, to, to have a more global society, I guess is what I see the potential for. Nice, nice. Well, we will end off on that conversation piece that we, have, we were, I think all men would love a better global world. <laughs> and I, I hope think, so. Yeah. And I think, and those who love them would love to have a better global world. So that yeah. is always a, a good wish, but it just, it's got to start with each man individually. And as I was sharing with the young gentleman, I was helping today. I said many years ago, there used to be a company called Starter. Uh -huh. And and they had a line of t-shirts and I wish I would have kept it, at least one of these t-shirts that said, it all starts with you. Mm, I remember that one. I do. And I, I, for the men and those who love them who are listening to this conversation live or on replay or watching it live on replay, that would be my, my message for you men for the next decade. It all starts with you. I second that. It all starts with you. It all starts with you. Robert, as always, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your positive, productive schedule to uh, share with myself and many others. And if people want to touch base with you, how can they do that? They can reach me at uh, homcoaching.com. That would be the best way. Or they can look me up on Facebook, Absolutely. Robert Leo. Yeah. And myself, um, if you want to get in touch with me, the best place to go to is my website, the drvibeshow.com. If you want to find out more about the great initiative, Men and Masculinity, go to their website, menandmasculinity.com to catch replays of all these epic conversations. We've been doing it for a while, and we, as we said, plan to do them throughout 2020 and beyond, as long as uh, we get Robert and MJ on the, on the go, and I'm sure they'll be I'm all for it. I'll be here. Excellent. And uh, for those who are watching or listening live on the replay, our next epic conversation will be on the 30th of January and we'll have MJ Durkin, Durkin talking about the same subject. And next month we'll have Robert and MJ going at another conversation piece. And we're also going to get some other conversationalists or thought leaders on the platform also, because believe it or not, there are more than Robert and MJ as male thought leaders. <laughs> and we don't want to burn a lot them. more. Yes. A lot more. <laughs> And we don't want to burden them with everything. So as always, I, never a burden. Thank you. I like to say, um, your live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. Block assumptions and the, like to end off with: aim bigger, aim better, aim wider, aim higher.
much for all your support, all your support. And please reach out to us if there's a conversation topic about men or manhood or masculinity that you'd like us to host. We'd be happy to bring your conversation topics to the platform. Good night, everybody, and keep the faith. Good night, Dr. Vibe. Good night.